Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. I'm your host, Chet Czar. This week we've got Mitch Horowitz on again. He was on a few weeks back and I got tons of great feedback about him being on the show. And he's got a new book out called Uncertain Places, Essays on Occult and Outsider Experiences, and it's really great. And uh, he's coming on to promote it and just talk. We're going to talk about the book. We talk about all kinds of other cool stuff too. So that's coming up. And uh, let's see what's been going on. Oh, this is kind of funny. I recorded this whole intro already, but um, the the audio is screwed up, <laughs> so I have to do this again. So that kind of throws a whole wrench in what I was planning on doing for this intro. But um, oh man. Anyway, uh, so I have to go over everything I already went over. So I have to think about what I went over. I went over um, what's been going on in my life, and that is. Uh, still settling back in from that zombie death, death bots show, getting ready for the holidays. Cause that's when, uh, I make most of my money that's, uh, on my website. So I'm trying to get the mystery boxes ready. Uh, mystery boxes are a big seller. So I'm trying to come up with some cool stuff to put in the mystery boxes and prepping for that stuff and just dealing with things that I had to let go while I was painting for the show. It's really uh, hard doing shows every year. I know I complain about this all the time, but it's taken me a while to get back on track. Like today's, I feel kind of normal today. Uh, but prior to today, I've been feeling like unmotivated and kind of exhausted, but I don't like sitting around and not doing anything. I really get bored easily. I just feel like I should be doing something. I like doing things, creative things. And, um, so I've, ha and I have all the stuff I have to do, all these commissions and, you know, things I'm trying to catch up on. And I just have had no energy to do them and it's just been driving me nuts. So, uh, but I'm starting to feel better. This happens every time I was asking my wife, this happens every time, right? Every time after a show for like a week or two, I'm all kind of, uh, and then I come back once my body gets enough rest, I suppose. Anyway, that's what I'm dealing with, uh, but I'm feeling better. <clears throat> Things are going well. Um, so, uh, if you want to win a skull from the skull shop, where's the skull? Here's a skull without the jaw. S-K-U-L-L-S-H-O-P-P-E. -L -L -E. They are giving away one skull a month. And I'm behind on this raffle thing, whatever it is. Um, in order to get on the get in on the raffle, I'm not gonna record this again. <laughs> I recorded this thing, the whole thing. And then I kept trying to do it over and over. And I probably did it 10 times and I kept screwing it up. So I'm just going to go straight through. I don't care how many fuck ups I have. Um, if you want to support the podcast, let me say that first. <laughs> I am the worst. I'm the worst podcast host. I swear to God. Um, if you want to join, uh, help support the podcast, go to Dark Art Society. Uh, uh, <laughs> God. Patreon.com slash Dark Art Society, and you can join for as little as a dollar a month, and it really helps us out. If you join at the $5 level, you will be entered to win a skull from the Skull Shop, and their web address is S-K-U-L-L-S-H-O-P-P-E dot com. Now, I'm about two months or three months. I don't know. There's The last couple of months, I haven't had time to do the drawing, so I may do another one next week or or sometime this month to try and um catch up on them but the thing is look if you're watching on youtube i have this hat i had all the names and i already did the drawing on the last uh attempt that had the messed up audio so you can't see me do the drawing you're just gonna have to trust me but rich page is the winner this month or this week or whatever rich page so you, you have a free skull from the skull shop coming. So rich page, get in touch. I will send you an email too. Um, yeah. So, okay. Got that out of the way. Oh, new subscribers. 
uh, if you join too at any level, you get your name read on the show, which is kind of exciting. So let's read the new subscribers. Okay, we've got Brad. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, Robin Lagosi. Robin, I know Robin from Twitter. Thank you so much for supporting. Michael Meach. Um, Michael upped his pledge. Thanks, Michael. Michael does really cool <clears throat> mushroom and mushroom creatures and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, Daniel Cataldo. Thank you so much, Daniel. Jordan McCleary. Thank you, Jordan. And Isabella Elise Duante. Thank you so much for supporting. You make it happen. I really appreciate it. And you allow me to create this podcast and keep it free for everyone who can't afford to support. So that's awesome. Oh, I want to give a shout out also to Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. That's how you say it, right? Kyrgyzstan. Is it Kyrgyz? Yeah. Kyrgyz. Yeah. Kyrgyzstan. Shout out to Kyrgyzstan. I get these reports on the podcast and we are the number 30 podcast in Kyrgyzstan. Now, I would never have expected to be the number 30 podcast in Kyrgyzstan. So I thought I'm going to give them a shout out. So thank you for listening and supporting in Kyrgyzstan. Um, okay, that's it. Let's get on with, with the Mitch Horowitz interview. Always great dude to talk to. And here we go. So hope you enjoy it. Oh, one last thing. You may notice if you're watching on YouTube that the quality is better than it used to be. And that's because I'm recording through OBS and not through Zoom anymore. Uh, so that gives better video quality, which I'm looking for. I'm, I'm, I've been unhappy with the, the video quality. and um, But the main show interview is like two panels next to each other. The quality is better, but it doesn't switch back and forth like it normally does between the, the interviewer and the interviewee. Unless I'm missing something, I can't get it to do it for, you know, maybe I'll figure out how to do it. But for now, it's side by side. I am also looking into getting another camera. If anybody is selling a Sony A7 III, hit me up because I'm looking to buy one used. That's the camera I'm trying to get. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, anyway, hope you like it. Here we go. Mitch Horowitz. What's up, Mitch? How are you, my man? I'm good. I'm good. Oh, my God. What a morning. <laughs> it's been the, the power went out, and then right before I started oh, shit. set up, to, yeah, just randomly went out, and it's raining, which is great, but... um. <laughs> some gar some gardener showed up across the street and there was all this noise <laughs> are you recording by the way? yeah 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 okay good i didn't see a button come up i just want yeah to no no that's why i'm recording sure. through uh obs this time so it, it, it's recording this way we'll get Sweet. a better better video quality anyway well, great to see you yeah you too um yeah i really enjoyed your talk at um uh, philosophical uh research society it was Great. Thank you. Great. I loved being there. Yeah. And great bunch of people too. Really wonderful. It's so good being with people in 3D and just, you know, the group, the whole thing, and especially the workshop was a really peak experience for me. Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was, uh, it reminded me, I, cause I used to do <laughs> stuff like that often, you know, go to weird events like that back in, yeah. you know, in, in the late eighties and, right, right. and cause I used to live in Hollywood. <clears throat> And so uh, the 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 guy Jim Bikey I brought with me, he um, he used to, we were the you know spiritual trip buddies and all that, and we'd go yeah. around old Hollywood and check out all these old places. Oh, There's so great. much so much history of that that sort of thing. It, it really is. L.A. is the greatest. I just love it. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And uh, yeah. we we went at one time. We went to this. I forget what. If, I don't know if it was UFOs, something about UFOs or something about occultism, but Peter Straub, the writer, was there. Uh -huh. you know, he was there and a bunch of Hollywood weirdos like us, you know, it, was, uh -huh. <laughs> it totally reminded cool. me of the, the you know, yeah. I mean that in the best sense of the word. I of felt course, like course, I was yeah. like, oh, I'm among, among my people again. It's been right, so right, long. Right. <laughs> yeah. I had such a great time. I didn't want to attend. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. So, um, 
Yeah, your new book is great. Uncertain places. I, I, uh, how's how's it how's the promotion going with that? Oh, it's going really well. It's on sale tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, we're speaking on Monday, November seventh. I'm launching it tonight on Coast to Coast. So uh, while I'm on there with my coffee and vape stick, I assume it's going to go on sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. I like the format. You know how how you can kind of bounce around. Uh, just yeah, because it's essays. You know, uh, right collection right. of essays. Yes. Um, the war on witches was extremely disturbing. Yeah, Th- that chapter yeah, should be. Yeah. Right. Oh my right. God, that's. But and that know. was an interesting chapter for me because, um, that was a piece that ran in the New York Times in July of 2014, and they put you through an editing process that extends for months and months and months, especially if you're writing a piece that's outside the cultural space that they're comfortable with. Right. And. Um, I decided when I was pulling together this collection to actually put in the original piece I submitted because it's up to the reader to make his or her own judgment call. But after going through months of the editing mill and being told to get ready for fact checking, like I was storming the beaches at Normandy (laughs) and I sailed through fact checking because I had everything down so carefully, I looked back and I thought, "Mm, in some respects, I prefer the original. So I decided to run the original in this anthology. Perfect. And so it's it's a never before published piece about violence worldwide against witches. And people can look at the Times version, look at the original, see which they prefer. But I felt like that one deserved its own airing. How much uh, how different was it? Quite different. Really? Although I don't think better. You know, I mean, they they. They put you through an editing mill um, of uh, many, many different rounds. And then there's the fact-checking mill, which I, I pretty much sailed through because I had all my references down so cold. I mean, I mm-hmm. just built this thing like a tank. And I, when I got back the edits, I didn't have any problem with them, but I kind of felt like, mm, this is just different. I'm not altogether right. convinced it's better. So I decided to run the original and the reader can make his or her own judgment call. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, how, how do you, I mean, do you, how do you know how to do the process of making something uh and and ironclad like that because you're you're really big on references right. and backing up what you talk about uh, yeah. which i think is really important for the kind of writing you do and um i don't know just as a lay person i i wouldn't even know where to start i imagine you you know that from your your history in publishing uh well i guess it just comes through repeat use and and Effort. uh, Yeah, I know it from publishing to some degree. And I think uh, probably I sharpened my teeth on it when I was writing Occult America in Occult America, Mm. as well as my next book, uh, One Simple Idea. It's very heavily referenced, but I elected to do the references as little bibliographical essays at the end of the book. So Mm. if you're interested in something, you can turn to the end of the book, read the bibliographical essay or flip back and forth, I suppose. I didn't want to interrupt the narrative flow. I didn't feel footnotes at that time was exactly the style I wanted to do. And a colleague of mine, Jim Steinmeier, who's a great historian of stage magic, and he's going to be presenting at Mm. PRS in the not distant future. uh, I published several of his books, including a very good biography of Charles Fort. And I picked that style up from Jim, actually. He he turned his sources into bibliographical essays by chapter after each book and it gives you after at the end of, of of the book and it gives you a chance to expound on different things uh call out certain things identify certain things that uh you you could or couldn't do in a footnote necessarily um in um my book um daydream believer i have a very heavily referenced chapter on esp research and i sort of use those notes in a similar way although i decided to put them on the page since the factual basis of this material if if you're writing about it from a lab-based perspective is so important to establish and support and when i was doing the times piece really i i just knew that i i i needed to have everything lined up yeah with exactitude i wanted to put my best work forward in every respect so um i just had a massive file of reference materials and <laughs> Everything was 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 recallable almost at an instant. Right. But they still changed it. <laughs> yes, they did. They feel obligated to. The Times has been described as an editor's newspaper. They they go through and they edit and they edit. And 
to some extent, they're bringing a unified voice to the paper, which is fine. And I would say the edits were good. I never had any problems with them. Um, but I just didn't feel it was necessarily a step up from where I began, frankly. Right. How many times have you written for the New York Times? Oh, just a couple. I wrote that op-ed piece. I wrote a like debate piece that, that appeared on the letters page that people debated. Um, and I would say that's about it, you know, aside from just some uh, letters and things of that nature. So it's, I mean, was it kind of nerve wracking? Because that's oh, very much so. <laughs> it's I don't of... have any contacts there or anything. I, I I got to know an editor there from the letters page, and she connected me with somebody from the op-ed page. And I think there was a, a a certain degree of resistance at first because any piece that deals with supernatural subject matter, even though in this instance we're really just talking about crimes against people for identity purposes right. or people getting accused of being something that they may not identify as at all. Um, so I saw it as a piece, uh, a human rights piece, not a piece right. about the occult, but a human rights piece. But I think the suspicion is that, uh, oh boy, you know, here comes Casper the Friendly Ghost, and I'm, <laughs> you know, going to let loose on shit. And you know, I just saw it as a human rights piece, very important human rights piece. And and but I think the subject matter, even though there was nothing belief oriented in the piece. Right uh raised a lot of eyebrows at least at that time it's probably more relaxed now how long how long ago was that piece written 2014 20 oh okay mm -hmm. that's way back uh wow so you were you had written what had you written back then as far as your your books well let's see i had published a cult america and i had published one simple idea and i was probably just at the beginning of working on the miracle club oh okay uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Occult America is great. Wow. It's like, <laughs> it's such a cool idea too. And so started everything. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah that must have been, uh, uh, I don't, that's like, that was the beginning of your new life, right? Is, was that In many book? respects I, I had started, uh, I, I went through many years of dormancy where I wasn't writing at all. And then I started writing again in the late summer of 2003 I interviewed the Major League Baseball mm. pitcher, Barry Zito, wrote a piece about him, and then a couple of other interviews, and then I wrote a uh, literary kind of historical portrait of Neville, Neville Goddard, and that's what really got me started, because I, I think that came out in February of 2005, and I thought to myself, and I still believe, what you can do in microcosm, you can do in macrocosm, and so I knew that completing that Neville piece in a way that was satisfying to me meant that I could do that on a larger scale. And sometime thereafter, I spoke at PRS and s spoke on uh, occultism in American history. And that really became the kernel for the um, Occult America book. I was originally going to turn that into an essay. And um, my ex-wife said to me, that's not an essay, that's your book. And so I'm always mm. eternally grateful for that. And so with that encouragement, I turned it into a proposal and um, worked on the proposal for about a year. I mean, I really wow. put the pedal to the metal. I just wanted to do it so right. And right. I had never written on that epic a scale before. And um, so I spent about a year on the proposal. And then uh, after that was completed... I pretty much had a contract for the book um, within three months or so. And it was very gratifying and worked so hard on it. And I hope to always bring that level of work to whatever I do. Yeah. What's a what's a proposal? I mean, it, it, you're, it's like a proposal you're taking to a, a publisher saying, I want to write this book. Would you basically commission me to write this book? And here's what it yes. is. Yes. A lot of nonfiction books are launched that way. Less so fiction, of course. You know, usually that will, right. will be bought from something complete unless the author, him or herself, has a long track record. But I wrote a proposal of probably about 100 pages. And wow. I just felt like I owed it to myself to have the roadmap, to know where I was going, to understand how this book was going to come together and to persuade myself that I was actually capable of doing it. Right. So the proposal... <laughs> I always encourage people to really go to town on proposals because, first of all, by either writing the whole thing itself, which I did do with Miracle Club, or by writing the proposal in a really, really rock solid, committed, dedicated way, 
including a full sample chapter and so forth, um, you demonstrate that you're all in, that you're going to write this book no matter what. And it does have a, a psychological effect, a mm -hmm. practical effect on both the writer and the publisher, because it's it's made clear I am doing this thing. And when I wrote The Miracle Club, for example, I had a very dedicated idea of what I wanted to do in that book. And I elected to just write the whole thing before shopping it. And there were people who asked me to make changes. And I said, no, not because I'm uppity about making changes, but because <laughs> I just didn't feel like what they were proposing was any better. I thought they were trying to make it more familiar mm -hmm. and they wanted me to cut out certain things that maybe they thought wouldn't have significant appeal. And I just refused that. And Inner Traditions uh, made an offer and I said, you know, I, I would love to be published by you guys, but this book is finished and I just wanted a light copy at it. And again, I wasn't doing any of that to be like high hat or 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 kind of um, excessively demanding. It's just that I've worked I had worked in publishing for many, many years, uh, a total of 27 years. And I know the strengths and weaknesses of the process. There are not frankly, very many good editors. There are not very many hmm. good copy editors. Many of the copy editors overreach and they really just fuck with things that they have no idea about. They change meaning. And it happened to me all the time. And um, the stories I could tell. I and uh, <laughs> by that point, you know, having two books below my belt and and having already worked in publishing for maybe mm, 25 years, I knew what I was after, you right. know, and I, I felt like, look, I'm not just going to go in and make random changes and start interjecting things that an editor thinks is going to make the book more commercial, which in effect is not the case, but is very often making the book more familiar. And, uh, you know, so I would have people say to me something like, well, we don't want you to use the term new thought because that's too... Um, distracting for people unfamiliar far out and i don't think that's true at all i think a lot of the time um in mainstream publishing there is a a poorly drawn and unresearched perception between certain editorial changes and an uptick in sales and it's just not true right. it's simply not the case um i i you know uh, there's no research whatsoever that goes on in publishing. Uh, there is a little, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I mean, there's research into pricing and ebook pricing and things of that nature, but that's exceptional. And beyond that, there's not a heck of a lot of research. There's just kind of seat of your pants decision making, which has a place, but that seat of your pants decision making is very often done in a timorous way where you're just basically trying to make a book look and sound and feel like something that's more familiar. And to me, that's not editing. Editing is for clarity and for the excellence of the vision. Right, right. It seems like as an editor, you the pr primary thing you would need was to know what the vision of the author is so that you can help the author clarify their vision if they need it. Yeah. You know, and you know, um, my feeling is you only edit when the author's in trouble. You know, if the author mm. is in trouble, then you step in and you help with something. But if the author is not in trouble, then let it be. You know, right, it right. Be. Yeah. yeah, it's like a producer with a band, I imagine. It's like a good producer yeah. is like Steve Albini or someone where they're like, I'm here to capture the sound of the band. You know, it's their job to come up with the sound, come up with the songs, and I just capture it. Right. You know what I mean? And if they're having a problem, then right. you try to help with the problem. But I don't, you know... Otherwise, cut your own album, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking about, uh, I know people who write books and just sell them themselves, like self-publish. And I'm sure that's, uh, you know, a difficult path uh, to take. Um, I can't imagine you make a lot of money doing it, you know, because... Well, some, some do, some do. If they're in a genre and they have a built-in audience social media presence it, it can it can work financially to their benefit yeah so you're not totally against self-publishing oh not at all no, <laughs> actually no. i self-published my book i wasn't even yeah. thinking of, of myself i was thinking about like you know literature or whatever damn good you know? <laughs> um 
my friend Christopher Dixon from the Theosophical Society was just staying over. He was getting a tattoo here in New York. Mm. He looked at the book and he was marveling over it. And he was oh, like, cool. this guy is a fucking genius. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> he is a fucking genius. He is. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> That's so cool. But uh, 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 a lot of people do self-publish. Whitley Strieber, for example, is self-publishing right oh, now. Oh, really? Because, yeah, you know, I mean, he got tired of shopping stuff around to publishers. And 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 he's got such a significant presence in the culture and on social media, as well as his his podcasts and such, that he can do it. And, right. and it works out well for him. And he keeps um, more money. And, yeah, and, that's cool. and, of course, Amazon helps facilitate that uh, as long as the rules don't change overnight, which they can. Yeah, right. And when that happens, it's scary as hell. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Yeah, so I think that's a legitimate path. Yeah, I, I, uh, a friend of mine named Martin Ball who's been on the podcast, he's, a, he's kind of, you know, a, a, a DMT researcher, I guess you could say. Um, really great, amazing guy, super smart guy, but he self publishes all his books and they're like, they're really good. They're really mm -hmm. well written and he, but he just self publishes and sells them himself. And, uh, I think, you know, he's doing it for the love of the game more than anything, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's you something know? to be said for it. You know, yeah. if a person doesn't have that outreach then, or a track record, then it is just kind of putting a message in a bottle and throwing right. it out to sea. I mean, you know. No one's going to find it because Amazon and 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 the publishing pipeline is so overwhelmed with new material. But right. if the individual has his or her own audience, has a name in the culture, has good outreach, it can be a very viable path. Yeah. Um, you know, you brought up Whitley Whitley Strieber. Uh, did, didn't you just interviewed him? Just interviewed him for a film festival that's being run by Screen Slate. And that's going to be at the Anthology Film Archives here in New York City. Uh, they're showing um, a festival of UFO themed films. And I'm going to be introducing Communion and Close Encounters. And so I interviewed Whitley for that. That's going to be up on Screen Slate very soon, uh, probably this week. Oh, cool. And it was a great discussion because I've known him and worked with him for over 12 years. But there was things he was telling me that... He had never disclosed before, including the fact that he may very well have appeared in the Kenneth Anger short Invocation of My Demon Brother, which is one of my wow. favorite movies. And it's like telling me you were in Apocalypse Now. And it's like, <laughs> you never mentioned this to me, you know. And uh, But that's Whitley. You know, he's an enigma. He really is. You know, when you meet him, first of all, he's a very approachable man. And he's actually a very affable man, mm. a very friendly man. Mm. And you know, when you meet him, you know, he kind of seems like your favorite professor from college or something. You know, he's a he's a he's a, a, a seemingly outwardly conservative man, but mm. he's got a real bohemian background that's just crazy wild. And he's collaborated with uh, the underground filmmakers, George Kushar, who shot an unreleased film at Whitney's Whitley's cabin from Communion and wow. uh, and 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 was on the set uh with anger when he was filming Whitley's not 100% sure it's him in the movie. He was like, it really looks like me, but I can't <laughs> tell you for sure. And it was just that kind of time. It was 1969 and, and anger was in London to shoot the Rolling Stones Memorial concert to Brian Jones. And he shot part of invocation of my demon brother there. And, and probably the majority of it in San Francisco. Uh, so we talk about that and a lot of wide ranging things I had not known about Whitley. Yeah, that reminds me. Uh, I mentioned, I think, on Twitter uh, about that my wife having seen this weird thing when she was a little girl. Yes, and yeah. it was, and it was, you know, when I saw. I haven't read. I don't think I read Communion. I may have read it in, you know, when it came out, possibly. But um, I know I have it. But um, you know, I've got, I got a ton of books. <laughs> it's like sure. everywhere, and I just haven't. You know, I don't have time to read them. Um, but. Uh, you know that weird little toy thing that floated in, yeah, and it had that weird round eyes and like, yeah, it, it, okay, what the fuck? What is it? And, and it, it, the thing that tripped me out when I saw that was that my wife told me <clears throat> when she was a little girl, she lived in a house that she said was totally haunted, mm -hmm. and but it wasn't like ghosts necessarily it was just weird shit would happen like mm -hmm. one time she saw uh what's i mean this is actually a weird kind of cosmic thing um i talk about it in my documentary where we we met through bikey jim bikey the friend i brought to the to the oh. show 
mm-hmm. we were both friends and he knew Lisa, my wife. And, uh, he said, he was telling me this story about how she, when she was a little kid, she saw the boogeyman. And I was like, Oh, well, tell me about this. And so he, uh, explained that she saw a, a man like in his, did I tell you this before? The man, no, okay, man, this man in this old chair that, um, she, they had in the house, uh, her friend, her and her friend, her friend was spending the night. It was late at night. There were, I don't know, six or seven or something. And she saw this man just sitting in the chair that was made out of like dots of light, like a T she said, it looked like a TV, like an old, old fashioned tube mm-hmm. TV, with little mm-hmm. dots of light. And he was wearing a zoot suit, like a forties gangster zoot suit. And wow. he, and he had kind of this flat face with this slut, you know, slit for a mouth was slightly curved and then just two slits for eyes. And I think a horn right here. Wow. Where the third eye would be. And he told me that. And I, I was in high school at the time because my wife's like five years older than me and, and Bunky is like five years older than me too. So I was, I was in high school. He was a friend of a friend of my brother's. They were at Cal arts in college. Anyway, we were both into makeup effects. That's how we met. But mm-hmm. so I had just gotten an airbrush and I said, wow, that's cool. I'm going to paint that thing. So I just painted it because I was learning oh airbrush God. and he showed it to her before we'd met and she said oh yeah it looks exactly like it and then like wow. five or six years later we ended up getting together and then we got married about a year later so that's one yeah isn't that crazy but so any- the boogeyman introduced you yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow. i never thought of it like that but it's true wow uh, yeah yeah and, and we're still married you know it's crazy that's amazing um so but one of the other stories that happened in that house was she saw this um turtle spider that came up out of the 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 sink she said there was this one bathroom at the end of the hall that she was always afraid to go to and she's very she's psychic whatever you want to call it like but not on purpose (laughs) you know she's just one one of those people that's naturally talented Mm -hmm. in that way um and she said she went into the bathroom and this little spy a spider turtle shell thing with spider legs like a turtle with spider legs and a, and a little head like a weird little turtle head that was kind of smooth with these black perfectly round eyes and a smile it was like a smiley face face on it wow and it came up and like poked its head up and it was smiling at her and you know she said she saw it like you know and it reminded me of that that uh thing from communion that yeah. that weird yeah. cartoony why would it be like that? You know, non-organic looking. Right. And it's just right. completely confounding to me, you know? A lot of things <laughs> like that occur around communion. You know, people will see things in it, uh, both the book and I assume the movie, that arouse some sense of recollection. And it's very archetypal. And... um I mean, even the cover of the original communion itself is one of the first iconic paintings of the greys. And it looks so eerily familiar to Mm -hmm. Alistair Crowley's drawing of the figure Lamb, the entity who visited him. I guess that was in the 1930s, maybe 1920s. I'm not sure. And, um, and, 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 and Whitley and his wife, Anne, who's, who's now deceased, received thousands of letters from people really pouring their hearts out, telling them that that book made them feel unalone for the first time mm. because they had had such encounters, call them what you will, that they couldn't uh, talk about or that if they did talk about, made them feel only all the more isolated and so forth. And that book has a huge effect on people. It taps something very deep in people's psyches. And for me, it's a great record of the paranormal because the book and and i always recommend it to to writers uh and to aspiring writers the book is very steeped in detail whitley gives names and dates and locales and i really appreciated that you know he's very very meticulous in that book of laying out everything and i just feel it's a model of its kind and Mm. and rarely matched by anything well i'm gonna get the audio book because <laughs> because that's that's the only way i have time to read nowadays yeah. unfortunately because i i am a huge reader i used to be a huge reader when i was a kid i'm the kind of person if i get a, a book i'll sit down and like the whole day will be gone 
Yeah. Like I just yeah. will not stop because I love reading so much, but you know, the way my life is now, I have to do audio books, but, um, which I have yours on pre-order. I'm waiting oh, for cool. it to come out because I do love, I, I wanted to mention, um, uh, your audio books are really great, you know, and it's like, usually I prefer reading, but your audio books, because your, uh, narration is so good. They're like, to me, they're like equivalent, which I've, Thank I've you. never, uh, thought that about an audio book before. Um, Thank and you. I've heard other people say this too. They like your speaking Thank voice. You. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. You know, it's, it's a funny thing narrating an audio book. You're not an actor. You don't want to be giving a performance, right. but you still have to bring inflection to it. Mm -hmm. And you still have to get across certain points of emphasis. And sometimes you'll be speaking in a character's voice and you don't want to just be speaking in this monotone way. Right. So you're, you're bringing something of the expression or the emotion to it without it being a full-blown performance, because you also want it to be enough of a tabla rasa so that the reader or the listener is having his or her own experience just like with the page design of a book, you know, I would always say to designers, the design is supposed to facilitate the reader's experience, not show how snappy the right. designer <laughs> can be, but 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 facilitate the reading experience. And likewise, a good narration should facilitate the listening experience, you know, and and not lead the reader by the nose to experience things in a certain way, but give an inflection that's faithful to the book but that still is neutral enough so that the individual has his or her own experience. So that narration, narrating audiobooks has just been like a huge joy for me. Hmm. And um, a recent nar narration that just came out is Neville Goddard's final lectures. And I worked really hard. on. Oh, that. you narrated that? Yes. Oh, yes. cool. Okay. Yeah. And I wrote a really detailed uh, introduction about Neville's uh, death and I, um, I uh, yeah, I, re I read uh, that on Medium. I think was was that on Medium? Oh, I don't think I put it up here on Medium yet. I might have put it on Patreon. Oh, okay. And yeah, um, right. and so I wrote a really detailed uh, introduction, having chased down Neville's death certificate and mm -hmm. trying to weave together its details with other few details of his death to give a a, a full picture and and a well documented picture. And then the remainder is Neville's lectures such as the record still exists that he gave in his final year with a number of notes uh, that I added just to clarify literary references or news references. And sometimes he, he would make reference to an extraordinary event in the news and I'd go and I'd look it up and I'd find it's dead to rights what Neville said and uh, equally uncanny. And, and, and so I provide a number of annotations just to direct people to a reference when he's very specific about something. Um, like, for example, in one of his lectures in May of 1972, he talks about how an ocean liner, a passenger liner called the Queen Elizabeth II, was uh, received a, a hoax uh, bomb threat. And they were told that there was a bomb on board and unless such and such a sum of money was delivered to such and such an account, uh, the bomb would go off. And turns out... Um, that uh, hoax bomb threat occurred uh, just about uh, maybe 18 hours after the ship had set sail the night before a young woman who was in a creative writing course at Hunter College here in New York City had written a short story exactly on that theme of a hoax bomb threat or, or an attempt to hijack an ocean liner at sea for a certain sum of money with a threat to do such and such. And, 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 and so after this incident occurred, cops are investigating her. They're investigating wow. the students in the class to see, whoa, did somebody take this idea and actually act on it? And there was a story written about this young woman by Joseph Lelyveld, who I had knew who had been later the executive editor of the Times. And um, I didn't really know him, but I had just been interviewed by him on one occasion. And so Lelyveld writes this full story about this young woman. Neither she nor any of the classmates or the professor or anything uh, had any connection to this hoax bomb threat, but it mirrored her story in very significant ways enough so that the police were seriously interested. 
And Neville's point was, look, there you go. Everything begins as an idea. You never know where it's <laughs> going to travel. And, and so I footnoted the stories just because I want people to go back and be able to check these things themselves and see the extent to which uh, Neville's statements conform to the record. You know, he's always been remarkable that way. So um, forgive me for the for the tangent, but that that audio was a um, a big effort, a big effort. And I'm, I'm very gratified by the whole thing. Well, that's great. I thought for some reason, I thought you just wrote the introduction. I didn't realize you. Um... No, I wrote the intro. I assembled it. I annotated it, um, oh, edited it for clarity. Right. And, uh, you know, I let Neville's words stand alone and um, and then and then narrated it. OK, well, that's another one I'm going to have to get on audio book. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I haven't read any any Neville stuff. That's that that was one oh. one dude I missed. You know. Oh, you can jump in almost anywhere. You might want to start with one of his own books. Um, Power of Awareness is a great one. Mm. Awakened Imagination is a great one. Um, he his books are short and brilliant and just carved like gemstone. You know, they're beautifully done. Cool, cool. Okay, I, I definitely will. Uh, going back a little bit to to the the. Um, communion thing i uh i i had that uh, a similar feeling when i saw that movie fire in the sky yeah you know? i talked with whitley about that very movie yeah the, you know the scene the abduction scene sure i you know because i've had a ton of out-of-body experiences i've never been mm -hmm. abducted by aliens or, or whatever you want to call it but when i saw that i i was like that's that's an you know I, I don't even remember now what I found in common with, with an OBE, but it was like, uh, to me, that was, it was more like a, an out of body, my experience of out of body experiences than it was like someone being taken and abducted. There was something about it. I don't remember what it was. I need to watch it again, but it's, it's a really great movie. Yeah. It's part of the lineup at anthology. And I, I spoke with Whitley about that movie and I, I wondered if he liked that movie because I felt that movie was a really good sensitive portrayal of the psychological anguish that the witnesses and the abductee experienced mm -hmm. afterwards because people were not believing them. They were accusing them of being hoaxers. And uh, Whitley really responded well to that movie. And we have a, a, a significant exchange about it. And I mentioned to him that, you know, people are, in the film as as occurred in real life or making fun of the uh witnesses and saying oh you guys are just in it for the money and i said to him if these people had any idea the going rate of book advances they would <laughs> right. put that to rest <laughs> immediately yeah <laughs> um there is not a, a a shitload of incentive to do this stuff for the money and to have all your neighbors think you're a crackpot and right. an asshole and you know <laughs> then have people piss on you on wikipedia and right. so forth and so um, it's a lot of bravery, you know, that it takes. And, um, I love when the, uh, um, these tin, tin pot skeptics, you know, say like, you know, you're, you're just doing this for the money. And it's like, dude, <laughs> if you knew the first thing about money <laughs> and if you've ever been in a position in your life where you haven't had money, yeah. uh, I can assure you, you would not think of being, you know, an abductee, a witness, or an occult historian, because that's right. the fucking path. That's the path to easy street. <laughs> exactly. You know? like it's so, I don't know, you know, what walks of life these people come from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only someone with money would ever think that, like, you know, the paranormal would be the way right. that, you know, an enterprising person would decide to seek money in this. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, I, re so. I was. I remember. I was at one time. I was accused. Of course, it was a, a political dig at me. Um, say someone said, "Oh, you're a, oh, you're really working class, a second generation artist living in California." Like that made me, that meant I'm rich. It's like, yeah, my right. dad was an artist and he was broke as shit while we were growing right. up. And His I, painters and I, just <laughs> fucking clean up. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> That's why Van Gogh got into it, you know. Yeah, but it's like, you know, the people's, uh, I guess, you know, people's understanding are like, you know, if you can make a living doing creating art or you're a writer, you're just, you're raking in the bucks. And it's like, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, look, you know, there's two different classes of, of artists. I mean, some are born into it in the sense that they come from a very august 
uh, 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 literary or media right. background, and then they can really fast track it. Right. Um, but if dad was a painter and mom was a noise artist, um, that is not, <laughs> you know, a path to financial security, uh, typically. And um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, but, uh, you know, people don't know. People don't know. It's like one. Of, it's like anything. You get into a, a field and you realize it's like, oh, this is just kind of like the rest of normal life. Like you know, as a kid wanting to get into the movie business, it was like you know such a big, amazing, uh, uh, you know, it's an exalted idea that you're that you're yeah. going to be making movies, and then you get there and it's like, it's just like another job. I mean, it's cool and everything, but it's like another yeah. job. And and I'm sure it's like that in publishing and it's like that and it's like that in the fine art world. I thought like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I reached a plateau in makeup effects in the film industry. So I'm gonna go to the highest thing I can think of, which is fine art. And I you know, I get to paint whatever I want, which is amazing. You know, I, I love that. And it is great. And I'm not complaining, but it's a job. And there's sure networking with galleries and galleries run like Absolutely. businesses then they're just people you yeah. know and you just have to kind of get in there and i'm sure it's like that in writing and publishing it's like oh sure you, you know? know look people sometimes get book contracts for major publishers and they think wow my ship has come in and you know it's it's it gives you an imprimatur of legitimacy for sure mm -hmm. and there are right. benefits that come from that without question definitely but uh, in terms of the promotion and the outreach and what to expect from the publisher to a very substantial degree, you are out there on your own. And um, um, the publisher, if they're good, will help. But I mean, my God, you know, it's just one more galley that's going out to a show that's getting thousands of them a week. And right. so much of it still comes down to the individual. Okay. I wrote a few things down, because right. I, because and I, I don't usually write stuff down. I'm on me, <laughs> but but I these are things I have thought, you know, over the last I don't know as long as I've been aware of. Well, I guess maybe since the last over the last month or so, regarding. I wonder what Mitch thinks. So I did write them down, <laughs> um, just cur just out of curiosity. The one thing that I didn't write down, um, uh, going back to the OBE alien abduction thing, is. I find that a more uh, likely possibility that yeah, alien abductions are more related to out of body experiences than they are to, you know, people physically kind of being taken mm -hmm. away in a spaceship. There's yeah. some kind of relationship, like they're they're related for sure, don't you think? Like out, do, out of bodies it, and like all dimensions and dimensions of the mind. It's like so confusing, though. Well, one of the things I write about in the first chapter of Uncertain Places is the question of whether the UFO thesis is an experience of interdimensional yeah. activities, uh, whether certain individuals through their psyche are able to perceive or travel among different intersections of time, different interdimension, different dimensions, which is not as far out a, a, a thesis as it sounds, because so many things that come out of quantum mechanics, quantum theory, um, psychical research, um, different perceptual studies of the manner in which experience concretizes as reality sometimes in very plain and clear ways like neuroplasticity mm. or the placebo response other times in more um theoretical ways as we're trying to understand what what the effect of the observer is and the actualizing effect of the observer and the measurement process uh within quantum mechanics which is not limited to just tiny particles alone but goes into other areas as well and uh, including actually uh, Bell's theorem which allows us to measure the differences that different objects elicit over one another bends in space-time which we know are absolute facts which are provable and demonstrable mm -hmm. all these things layered atop together make it easier to talk about different dimensions or or intersections of time if we assume that there's an infinitude of now 
and that there's right. a, a nowness to everything that's going on. We know linearity is not absolute. We know time is conceptual. We know time bends in conditions of extreme gravity, extreme velocity, and seems to be subject to bending in the uh, uh, ASP lab as well, um, with reference to experiments on precognition, retrocausality. So it's, mm. it's, 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 in some respects, in some respects, it's easier for us to theorize about UFOs or ETs being interdimensional than being, in fact, extraterrestrial, because we have better theoretical models, more developed theoretical mm. models, doesn't mean they're true, um, pertaining to I I di different dimensions than we do pertaining to the capacity to cover such unfathomable distances as right. would be required if we were just talking about space phenomena. And so that's one thing. And, and another is that in this conversation I had with Whitley that's forthcoming, his wife, Anne, uh, curated the thousands and thousands of letters that they received in connection with communion. And she felt absolutely persuaded that the, the, the ET thesis or the, the, the phenomena of the visitors as recorded in communion and as recorded in the vast uh, catalog of letters that Whitley and Ann received, uh, she felt that it correlated with uh, after death experience and that the only that there, there was absolutely and without question an intersection between the uh, visitor's experience, the after-death experience, that they were intimately linked. So, you know, in that vein, I mean, we talk about after-death experience, that's related to out-of-body experience right. in the sense that there's some non-physical self that persists. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, you know, <laughs> it just... It, it completely it's confounding because there's just not a clear there's you know there's no, there's so much information and and uh anecdotal information about all of these phenomena and it's like there's not anything to hold on to, to in my mind at right, all right. none of them are like i can hold on to this thread they're the only common thread i can find is that they feel related to one another because they're sort of like this other thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, out of bodies or, kind of, you know, remind me of, uh, what I know about, uh, abductions, uh, alien abductions and, and, uh, lucid dreams are related to out of body mm -hmm. experiences because mm -hmm. I've had both of those. And I, you know, and it's like, it's there, there's a blurry line between the two of those, you know, and some of like, I've had out of bodies that kind of turned into, uh, lucid dreams and I've had lucid dreams that turned into out of bodies and there's a mm -hmm. difference, but they're, they're very similar. And it's, and it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I had a really interesting, um, lucid dream. They've lucid dreams to me feel like the same feeling as an out of body experience. Mm hmm where it's like you're conscious, you're like going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm floating around. But, but I had one, uh, one time where, where I, um, uh, was in this, I mean, I could still picture it. I was in this room and I was like, oh, I'm in a dream. And I start, and I was, you know, doing some weird things. I saw a basketball hoop and I jumped up and I it, took a big bite of the backboard because <laughs> mm -hmm. I was thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to see what I can do in here. And I just started doing mm -hmm. weird things like that. But I saw, I got so excited when I realized it was a dream. I saw this woman sitting there and I ran over to tell her. And as soon as I started telling her, she turned into a doll. Mm. And she turned into this, this weird, like those dolls that you squeeze and their eyes bulge out, the mm. stress relieving dolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought that was really telling if, mm -hmm. you know, dreams are kind of like projections of yourself in a way. It's like, as soon as mm -hmm. I told her the truth, she turned into this object. Mm. Uh, you know, anyway, wow. that, that, that's a, that's a, 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 a tangent, but, um, yeah, just the way some of the footage of these spaceships going into water too. That's the other thing that trips me out. It's like, mm -hmm. that is a physical thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so how does water, how does going under the surface of the water relate to this idea that these things are multidimensional? Cause that seems like such a physical act, like a place, it does. you know what I mean? You know, maybe the observer needs to be present, and if the observer is present and 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 cognitive, then 
it's reproducible. I, I, I mean, it's another of these things that upend any neat theory because nothing, nothing fully holds together other than the persistence of the the data, the evidence, and the testimony. Yeah. It's tricky because it's like, you know, we as a society don't like to have evidence without a theory. And part of the whole scientific process, uh, I wouldn't say it's intrinsically part of it, but it's become culturally or socially part of it, is that you have to have a theory. And so, uh, you know, we had fossils that demonstrated um, evolving life forms prior to Darwin's theory of evolution. And then when Darwin theorized evolution, suddenly all these dominoes appeared to fall into place. But um, the evidence existed prior to that. And the want of a theory um, is a, a difficulty in Western, in a Western framework. And what goes on is so violative of the kind of neat categorization that we use sometimes when devising a theory. So it's a, it's a time to hold sustained questions. I mean, it's a time for theorizing, but it's also a time to acknowledge evidence and, and sustain questions. And it's such an uncomfortable place to be. Very you much. Know, it's, it's the uncertain place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that kind of brings me to a question I have written down. Um, okay. I was thinking that maybe the underlying, you know, everything, it feels to me like uh, society's kind of collapsing in a way, not not that extreme, but things yeah. are disintegrating, faith in institutions, uh, people don't trust each other, everyone's polarized politically, everything seems to be kind of falling apart to me. I mean, that's the, that's the perception I think most people have, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm wondering... I wonder if the root of that is the fact that scientifically th the things that you've talked about with Schrodinger's cat and, and these, and these things that basically prove that life is not this binary thing that, you know, uh, there is not, it's, there's kind of is not, there's not a yes or no right or wrong. It's black and white thinking is kind of a, a different paradigm and, and be and scientifically from mm -hmm. the evidence. And I'm thinking specifically um, regarding things that you've talked about in your books. Uh, it kind of upends the whole uh, theory of material reality, or at least yep. puts it into question. So yep. I, I wonder, and it's, and you know, you talk about scientists not wanting to accept this data that, proves that that's you know that's not the, that scientific materialism is not necessarily the way reality truly is and i don't i just wonder if this you know the is the underlying root of the of the disintegration of everything because that's the foundation of of everything that this kind of this kind of uh scientific materialism type of worldview well, it's very interesting. Um, the founders of quantum mechanics were all, I think, to a person, philosophical idealists. They believed in a perceptual basis of reality, measurable, empirical reality. Mm -hmm. So the founders of what we consider today to be world-class science were philosophical idealists or perceptualists. Um, later, um, materialism, which has been with us in its current form for 300 years or so, uh, came to really dominate the scientific and media apparatus, at least in its mainstream expressions. And there's no reason why philosophical materialism, which basically believes that matter creates itself, we live within a box of Newtonian um, standard Newtonian physics, where up is up, down is down, there's one of everything, and um, uh, thought is nothing but an epiphenomena of, of the brain, um, just, 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 just as, you know, air passing through a whistle, and, and, and it's, it's, it's nothing other than biochemical processes that are gone once the organ is gone. That belief in materialism is a position, it's not the equivalent of science, and it's hmm. it's a sub philosophy within the modernist uh, catalog. Um, I would just soon say the occult is a sub philosophy within the modernist catalog. Uh, there's not one more intrinsic to 
to modernism than the other. And when I say modernism, I'm just talking about the belief that there are detectable antecedents to stuff that goes on that we experience in life. So, you know, if you're a Marxist, that's class struggle. If you're Freudian, that's trauma. Uh, you know, even in the sciences for Louis Pasteur, that was germs. For mm -hmm. Darwin, that was an orderly biological development of life. For William James, again, going back to psychology, it was self-image. And uh, for Einstein, it was time and space. You know, the whole modernist idea is that there's something at the, there's something behind the curtain and that it's detectable and that there are these underlying causes. Um, materialism has settled itself into a very a comfortable but small box in which it absolutely insists that everything is a mechanical process. There's no extra physicality and that um, whatever it is that we have to discover beyond, you know, beyond Newtonian physics won't upend our, our, our basic top-down hierarchical binary, yes, no, opposite black and white view of the world. It is what it is. And, um, materialism itself has become the anomaly. There's so many exceptions mm -hmm. to it, some of which we've alluded to, uh, 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 that materialism is the anomaly. But it's going to remain dominant for a long time because it's so heavily entrenched in media. It's so heavily <laughs> entrenched in academia. And the people who espouse it, and this is the trip, they think they're espousing utter normalcy, utter total normalcy. And the implications of... Uh, quantum mechanics don't matter. The implications of um, any surreal uh, functions like mirror effects that are observed where objects at great distances and no apparent connection affect one another doesn't matter. Um, anything having to do with psychical research, out-of-body experience, near-death experience is fantasy and is nonsense. Um, you know, uh, UFO claimants are crazy and 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 life is just great and comfortable <laughs> and we don't have to worry about any of this shit and 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 yet you know it's easy for them at the present to dismiss certain testimony uh, and 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 I suppose um maybe because of the overwhelming force of familiarity and common observation back of their claims it's it's just as easy to not think about the implications of neuroplasticity uh, not to think about the implications of some of the more advanced placebo studies not to think about the implications of quantum mechanics and so on and so forth and so they find it um comfortable to defend that point of view to the to the point where it seems like defending to them the point of view that water is wet and they never question it. And, and so if there's a, a impeccable bulletproof ESP data, uh, statistically based coming out of academic labs that we've had for 80 years, you shoot the messenger, you know, it's crazy. Right. It's nuts. If you can't discredit the material, well, there are two approaches you can take. You can take the approach of saying, um, you can take the approach of, of polemically and emotionally discrediting it, which, which works pretty well. Uh, it's done pretty well for, you know, the, the, uh, mob skeptics uh, who crowdsource um, uh, Wikipedia and, and yeah. troll articles <laughs> about, you know, anything having to do with uh, ESP, parapsychology. So it's worked. Um, and and for those who are maybe a smidge more searching or honest, uh, they might call into question the overall method by which we gather statistics, which is a reasonable question. But But you don't make the poster child for that uh, that methods problems uh, research that's been conducted impeccably. Right. If the if the starting point is ESP isn't real because ESP isn't real, then you've got to either discredit the research or discredit the whole model on which it's based. And um, the former discrediting the research usually leads into emotion and polemic and frankly dishonesty. And the latter discrediting the 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 whole model of social science studies is a reasonable question, but you need reasonable examples. And um, if an ESP researcher has followed the rules of the road, then he's nobody's poster child for bad practices. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, I, I'm I'm thinking of it in a in a uh, I am you know <laughs> I'm a, I'm a high school graduate. Um, that's it. <laughs> I'm very, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not 
an academic kind of person. And then, uh, so it's like, I, I, uh, I think, but I think in terms of, I don't know, I see things in a weird way. Um, and, and to me, it feels like, uh, it feels like just unusual to me that everything's kind of collapsing at this, at the same time that our, this model of reality is collapsing in a way too. Like our understanding mm -hmm. of a re reality is changing and all this other stuff is changing too. Like even the, right. the even the idea that people are now coming out as non-binary and, and the whole gender issue is very much like an example of uh, the way reality is not non-binary. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost mm -hmm. like the more we understand about the nature of reality, it, it reflects in physical reality in some way you know, you know what, I mean? what you're saying is fascinating because it's like okay so let's say there's some guy who's never heard of schrodinger's cat bell's theorem neuroplasticity none of this stuff is is familiar or perhaps not even interesting but it may be that on some innate level the fact that we've been um how can i put it the fact that that we've been kind of messing with the consensus of what reality is over the say the past century at mm. this point you know ever since the advent of parapsychology as a field quantum mechanics and so forth shit is coming apart quietly but persistently and that may seep into the groundwater of everybody's perception maybe that's happening maybe this stuff you don't need to know this that or the other thing it's going on you know it's it's occurring right and the very fact that it's occurring and that there are observers present just like there's an observer present when uh you know the ufo apparently goes into the water the very fact that somebody's observing it well, I guess the basis of idealism to some degree is that the the experiencer actualizes, the experiencer actualizes. So this stuff is occurring. And as it's occurring, whether or not one has heard of it, specifically cares about it, whatever, it may be upending our perceptions in a way that's causing this societal shift. You know, I remember many years ago, I was having lunch with somebody. It was a professional lunch. It was back in my publishing days. And we were talking about um, something that was in the news at that time, which is that um, fossils had been found on Mars through one of these um, probes that landed on the surface of the planet. And these fossils may have indicated the presence of microbial life. So we're talking about life on Mars. And I was telling her how far out I found all this. <clears throat> and she said to me, you know, I register it, but it hasn't affected my life. I don't feel any different. I don't feel like I'm part of some revolution. And I said, you know, I acknowledge that. But sometimes these things can subtly seep in, mm -hmm. you know, get absorbed by this sponge that is us and and work changes in ways that aren't immediately apparent so yeah you're not going to stop going to work tomorrow but maybe maybe the awareness of that over time starts to alter things just like a chemical process might alter a loaf right. of bread or something how much yeast is there in it and 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 so the leavening can take a while but maybe that's exactly what you're describing yeah, it, it's it's just it, that's the thing that struck me when I was reading you talking about these um, uh, experiments and 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 um, uh, you know just the, the, the idea that re that reality is so much different than um, uh, potentially so much different than what we think of as consensus reality, mm -hmm. um, and it's just weird that it's. It, it's just it's happening everywhere at the same time and i started thinking about you know uh um again you you know you uh, you said something about reality being non-binary i thought i thought you were you'd written that yeah. which got yeah. me thinking about um so much with so much about um uh uh you know like i said non-binary people 
being more common now. It's still right. not, still not a huge thing, but um, it you know, and then you've got this huge you know people the people that accept consensus reality cannot deal with the fact that there's non-binary people, and a lot of that has to do with the mm-hmm. media media they consume and stuff like that. But it's it's um, in the same way I imagine they people would don't want to accept the idea that reality isn't black and white and isn't easy right. to understand and isn't comfortably binary, you know, in the right. way that we're accustomed to. We're very accustomed to thinking in opposites and that can be useful perhaps right. in some ways, but it can also really hem us in to absolutes when absolutes might not be explaining things for us as a model. So for example, you know, we all very frequently think both in psychological terms and in physical terms as there being this magic bullet that's going to solve something. So if somebody's going to therapy, for example, and they're like, you know, why am I so fucked up? You know, and <laughs> there's got to be a reason, you know, and it was because this, it was because that. But very often when we're having a problem, it's a complexity of things and there may be a complexity right. of solutions. And what happens with the professional skeptics, for example, is that you'll bring up um, the placebo response and they'll say, oh, that's nothing but endorphins being released in the body, or it's nothing but inflammation reducing enzymes being released in the body. And it's like, that may be one of the things that's going on, but what would lead you to conclude that that's the only thing that's going on? And if endorphins are getting released, well, that might be one one that might be what the prayer response looks like in the body. That right, might be right. what hopeful expectancy looks like in the body. There might also be a number of other things going on. And what's the trigger of that? And is there some cause that goes outside of, you know, I mean, what is hopeful expectancy anyway? You know, what is the right. prayer appeal anyway? You know, and and we don't know whether I, 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 we 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 in the West have a tendency to discover one thing and as soon as that discovery uh, uh, seems defensible we're convinced we've figured out the whole bushel of apples Mm -hmm. we know exactly what's in that bushel it's the same kind of apple over and over all the way down to the bottom and of course we don't know that there there could be a, a great many things going on and that's what thinking in opposites or in absolutes or in a binary term gets us into it's this expectation that there's going to be this one thing that right determines everything yeah yeah and and that's you know i remember when i was first getting into really into spirituality when i was probably um i don't know 17 or 18 like really reading a lot of alan watts and krishnamurti and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and um that was like a realization i had back then like wow everything's in you know male or female everything has a male aspect and a female it was like this kind of realization that reality was divided into two things that's that was the realization of a 17 year old that was interested in this stuff and it's like that's kind of a stage i think because you know i think most people don't think about that shit at all but it's like you know to to think i used to i was you know like you know there's just you can if you wanted to you can divide everything into having uh, masculine properties and feminine properties. If sure. You, if you look yeah. for that, and uh, and as you said, it's like that's that that's a model. That's a mm-hmm. model for interpreting reality. It's not right. reality <laughs> necessarily. Right. Right. And uh, necessarily, yeah. you, you know. So I I don't know. It's just it's a uh, it's interesting. And, and it's interesting. Even that, within the male female. Um, perception within Gurdjieff's metaphysics and within hermeticism as well, you find that there's active and passive or to right. put it in gender terms, masculine and feminine, but then there's also reconciling. So there's mm-hmm. a third force right? and that third force could be expressed in different ways. You know, you could say that third force could be expressed even as unintelligible. You could have true, you could have false, you could have unintelligible, uh, active, passive reconciling. And, you know, that was the idea behind the divine hermaphrodite, a combination of mm. Hermes and Aphrodite, and that you have this third being. And so uh, we have a lot to regain, I think, by marrying uh, hermeticism and other philosophies on which maybe it stands to some of our, our, our more modernist points of view and to understand that unintelligible reconciling 
are necessary to help us navigate reality too. Yeah, I guess that's what comes down what it comes down to is what is useful for navigating this reality. And I think yeah. as things like uh these scientific discoveries happen and we have things like AI and technology that's going you know, none of us understand how it works. It's doing miraculous things. You know, we kind of need new models. I guess our models are developing uh, as as things happen in the way that we need them to. And it's causing turmoil right now because, you know, it just feels like, I, th I mean, do you feel that everything's in kind of in chaos? <laughs> it seems well, like that's the general feeling among I'm, people. I'm I'm kind of waiting, you know, I mean, I'm watching very carefully. Um, I, I mean, sometimes this comes out in our politics, you know, tomorrow is, is yeah. an election day and I assume Trump is going to announce his campaign any day now. And it's like, that's going to unleash a lot of energy. And that's, yeah. and again, you know, when I say energy, it's exactly, you know, to your point, that's just a metaphor. I mean, right. I could say energy, vibration, dimension, these are all just generalities that I use to get a point across um their concepts and and there's going to be a lot of energy unleashed and what that is and how to understand that and what that means I don't know but it warrants watching really really carefully yeah yeah I I it just you know I think most people seem to ha have the feeling that I don't know though every generation thinks they're the world's on fire and I, I, absolutely I, I don't think there's ever been a generation that didn't you know in the 1950s it's this era of like spreading prosperity but people here in the u.s but people are also worried that's like oh well we're gonna die in nuclear Armageddon yeah, tomorrow right. and it's like just watch the twilight zone i mean that was a wonderful um a kind of a receiving station for 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 mass fear and paranoia all of which was reasonable um and the idea that your neighbor is going to turn against you, the idea that, uh, you, you know, um, everything, you know, could 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 vanish tomorrow, including your own identity. Um, so that was very active in people's psyches in the 50s. And, and I don't think there's ever been a generation at peace or at war um, during periods of, of of status quo, during periods of upheaval that didn't feel itself on some sort of precipice. So you know, we, we have to keep that in mind for perspective as well. Yeah. I, I, I've been listening to this, uh, uh, Bob Dylan's autobiography. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, is that the one that Sean Penn read? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that book a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And Sean Penn is great because it's like he, he feels like you're listening to Bob Dylan speaking, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. Um, and just him talking about the the turmoil of the times. It's like, <laughs> you know, he's like he's it's like he's talking about today, you know. Yeah. And and it you know it sounded crazy from from the descriptions of riots and all these different towns all over the country and big cities and and the the civil unrest and it's like it sounds exactly like uh uh today but uh, mm -hmm. it, it's i just it just kind of struck me uh you it's know a great book yeah, yeah 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 i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying it it's it, i uh of course i'm relating it to magic a bit and and um I guess the satanic or the dark uh, uh, art thing in a way, because, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. he, he, he was speaking about, you know, he mentioned shamanism a bit and he's talking mm -hmm. about the magic of creating music. And he's also talking about having a uh, fascination with like some weird, you know, weird stuff. Like uh, I forget, he's talking about how in this apartment he's staying, there's like books on graveyards and, and, mm -hmm weird phenomenon and how he's kind of attracted mm -hmm. to that stuff and just his whole attitude is kind of dark in that in that way that we've discussed before uh uh not not the evil dark but you know the 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 the, the satanic in the way that you describe it it's like uh i was like you know he's basically like that <laughs> you know yeah me? and he would tease with these ideas you know i mean dylan Dylan, the thing, uh, there's so many things that I love about Dylan, and I think he's I'm new one. to him. I, it's like, I, I oh, this is all, I it's like, him. yeah, he's one of these guys where it's like, I knew I, sh I should, you know, I know the, all the songs that everyone else knows, but I never took the time to like read about him. And I just got, got on a rabbit hole the other day 
And so I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, no, no, I just I love him. I mean, like when when you listen to a song like Blowing in the Wind, which he recorded, I guess, 1962, 63, I just thought to myself, wow, that song was born an anthem. Like, right. you know, you can't imagine a time where that song didn't exist. It sounds like right. it must be a folk song. It must be something like uh, House of the Rising right. Sun that's always been with us. And yet <laughs> he was such a bellwether. He was so capable of absorbing and then and then expressing and it felt like this song is eternal this has always mm -hmm. been here like a hymn mm -hmm. and and i liked very deeply how dylan would take a position and then maybe he would change his position but he would never feel a need to apologize for it or to explain it away or to say i'm no longer that way like because he doesn't have to do that that's the freedom of the search if he wants to be a born again christian right. one day so, yeah, right. an orthodox <laughs> jew another day i don't know that bob was ever a satanist but he gave this <laughs> wonderful interview in the late 80s i think maybe early 90s on 60 minutes the news show yeah i just and watched that the, Oh, you watched the interview. As yeah. he's being interviewed by, I think the correspondent is Ed Bradley. Yep. He's a very disarming and charming interviewer. And Bradley says to him, uh, why do you still do it? Why are you still out here? And Bob goes, well, uh, I made a bargain and I'm just yeah. to hold up my <laughs> end of it. And he said, uh, a bargain? And he goes like, yeah, well, what was the bargain? And he goes, well, uh, to get where I am today. And he goes, uh, uh, may I ask who you made the bargain with? And Bob goes, uh, uh the commander of us all yeah right <laughs> and he goes of this world and he goes of this world and the world you can't see yeah <laughs> and it's like you know what you're doing bob you know and but it was great because yeah. it's like okay man we don't have to label everything according right. to you know what what menu of labels are handed down to us and I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to read too much into it, but I, I like the exchange, you know, yeah. and I like the enigma of the exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I. That's the funny thing is I, I got on this Bob Dylan rabbit hole because I was thinking Elon Musk with all the stuff that's going on with Twitter and yeah, it, it's like he's kind of like the Joker. He's kind of reminding me of the Joker. Like he's just, it seems to me, you know, not getting partisan or anything but it's like he seems to be into kind of like creating chaos and i mm. thought of that song joker man i don't know if you know that bob dylan song of joker, course man. i love that song. and it's like and that's one of the few we it's kind of like a not a super popular bob dylan song but i remember seeing that on tv when i was a kid or whenever it came out and for some reason that video always stuck with me it's like a really cool mm -hmm. video it's got like all these you know uh, art pieces it's got William William Blake paintings in it, and and mm -hmm. it's it's a really cool kind of video, and and I was going, wow, this is like Elon Musk's theme song in a way, because it's really a yeah. weird, very a, a weird song. It's not very clear about what it's about. There's all these people interpreting it. I was looking it up, but that got me on the whole Dylan rabbit hole, which got me to the the uh, the audio book, which I'm waiting I'm waiting for yours to come out because I listened to these on my walks in the morning. <laughs> and so I needed a filler and I was like, Oh, I'm going to get this Bob Dylan. Book. <laughs> <laughs> Bob can stand in. I've saved his ass before. So. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I love the man. I, I love the man. And, um, uh, Joker man, that's on an album called infidel mm -hmm. that Bob released. I think it was in, gosh, it was like maybe 1983 mm -hmm. and he was still actually a pretty young guy. Yeah. And I, I but at the time, I was, you know, 18 or 19, and I thought, wow, Bob is still around. How cool. Right. And it's like he's probably 40, you know. And so, <laughs> you know, but but there's a lot of maturity on that album. He did the song. A Joker Man is a song I really, really loved. And uh and and that was considered like a real later effort for him. But right. I, I I love that album. Yeah. It stands up incredibly well. Yeah, and he was saying that that's he thought that song was a failure, you know, like he was had too many ideas in it in in, in an interview. And I was like, I think that song's so amazing. I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, but but I, I just you know, I guess in the uh, um in the in the when I'm talking about, you know, that he's not necessarily satanic. I'm talking about in the way that sort of you talk about what satanic means. It's like he's mm -hmm. kind of a dark character in a way, in yeah. that way, in yeah. that good way that we like. You know, I always relate things to uh, dark art. You know, it's it's 
my, I guess, kind of my version of satanic, the way you would say satanic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, uh, right. just someone interested in kind of the mysteries, the darker side of things. Um, and, and that, that, I don't know, that attitude that everything's not just great as it is, you know, that kind of questioning yeah. attitude. And, and he, and he, he's very, uh, also very, um, he was all pissed off that people were, I thought this was so cool too. He was all pissed off that people were saying that you're like the speaker of, of our generation. You need to go out and right. lead, lead these protests. And he's like, I, you know, I'm about the the songs. I was trying to write great songs. I wasn't trying to be a leader of a revolution. It's like, I want to live with my family and my house. And I've got people like coming in, breaking in my house and people telling me I need to be out leading. And it's like, that's not why I was doing this. And he was really pissed about it. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, you know, he is a guy, it seems to me, part of his power comes from his willingness to always share his search. So, for example, um, when he um, embraced born-again Christianity in the late 70s, everybody was like, Bob, what the fuck are you doing? You know, and he records three albums Mm. that are very dedicated in that direction. And then he uh, got interested in Judaism and he kind of seem to change directions and everybody wants them to justify well first you believe that now you believe this and who are you and the seeker never has to respond to that question Mm -hmm. the seeker never has to definitively answer those questions for anybody and you know i loved how challenging bob was just by is just by sharing his search when he feels like it you know i mean there may be many things he hasn't shared but it's difficult for the post Woodstock generation immediately post Woodstock to start grooving to Bob as a born again Christian, but <laughs> that's simply his search. You right. know, and he's not trying to push people's buttons. It seems to me. So hence, you know, if I use the word Satanism, if I use other terms very freely, I'm not trying to push people's buttons. I'm simply, I'm, I'm, my work and my search are the same thing. And, and without transparency, both stagnate. And if I'm going to communicate as the seeker, which is the only descriptor I'll ever claim, uh, I'm just a seeker, um, expressing where I am with my search is just opening the door to exchange for whoever wants to participate in it. You know, yeah. I used to have these people rail against me on Facebook, which I'm no longer on saying, you know, we're tired of hearing your shit. And it's like, <laughs> dude, there's no federal legislation that says you have to be on this page. You do realize that like, you know, to log in a certain number of hours to get your retirement account to mature, like, you know, right. no way, you know? So that's all, you know, it's like, I, I love my readers. I love them because we're in an exchange, you know, just like what we're doing here. And yeah. anybody who wants to participate can. Otherwise, they don't have to. Uh, a spiritual teacher I love named Vernon Howard died in 1992. And one time Vernon, he used to camp out in Boulder, uh, Boulder City, Nevada, which is where Vernon lived. And he had a circle of students and uh, he did a public access cable TV show. And he announced one night, look, we're here every Thursday night. Everyone is welcome. If you don't like what you hear, don't come back. And I thought, that's fucking great. Like, he doesn't have to change his mind because yeah, you don't great. prove to him. Just don't participate. You know, it's like, you don't have to. <laughs> I, 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 You know, one thing I, I thought was funny at your, 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 your talk at the Philosophical Research Society was when you, when you uh, <laughs> on the break, you're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to really go for it when we go back in. Or you said something and I was like, I didn't know. I didn't know you were going to talk about Satanism. I just, I didn't know what you were going to talk about because I'm dense like that sometimes, but it would have been obvious when I thought about it. But um, I thought it was cool when you, when you brought it up, everyone cheered in the room when you said, we're going to talk about Satanism. Everyone was like, yay. And I imagine that's got to be like the polar opposite reaction you've had in the kind of new age circles when you first. Yes, absolutely. So it must be gratifying for you to have found an audience that understands what you're talking about and doesn't have this prejudice towards that. Yeah, it was gratifying because I didn't expect it. You know, usually expect people are going to go like, oh, Jesus, God, he's gonna, <laughs> does he have to do this now? We were having such a nice day. And um, 
or just stare at their feet or you know <laughs> giggle uncomfortably or something. But they, there was great receptivity, and I loved it, you know, because of engagement with the material. And of course, it doesn't always have to be that way. There could be people who don't like it or whatever, or right. who are like, uh, "Let's go back to the UFOs," or, right? You know. And, <laughs> um, but um, but you know, the, the the thing that was meaningful to me was there was a real engaged and informed response. And right. in this instance, that response was enthusiasm, and I was very touched because you never know whether you know. You just don't know. You simply don't know. And uh, you don't know if the organizer is going to be off in a corner going, oh, God. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was I was I was very touched and I was very touched that the 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 crowd's reaction seemed to indicate uh, an intimate understanding of what I was um, attempting. And right. it was a display of idealism. And that's so necessary on the search. I mean, you can't be a cynic on the path. Like if you're a cynic, then. What what do you do in any of this for? There's nothing yeah. left to discover, and and that's that. But I I was really very pleasantly surprised and and very happy, and I was glad they were happy too because they felt I was being transparent with them. I was talking straight with them. I wasn't saying like, oh, you know, I don't want to step on the third rail right. or bother anybody, <laughs> so I'm just gonna you know stay in this you know safer corner, you know, because how is that in the service of of searching together? So uh, I was very moved by it. Yeah, I think I think every you know the the enthusiasm was was because they wanted you to talk about that mm -hmm. they wanted it you know and and um it's it's funny because my understanding is that's just one aspect of your search the satan mm -hmm. satanism is one aspect mm -hmm. of your search and you don't right. like you're not like uh, uh uh hanging your hat on that or pushing that and being like, this is, I'm the Satanist guy. I'm the Satanist guy. Like, like making, right, marketing right. yourself as like, I'm going right. to ride this thing uh, uh, to, to a million dollars. It's like, you just are, re you reveal it in an honest way um, yeah. as part of your search. And um, I just thought it was cool that, that, that the whole room seemed to get it, including the people that ran the place. Cause, cause you know, my, my feeling, I mean, I don't know if anything beside behind the scenes, but you know, my feeling about that place is it's, you, you wouldn't expect, uh, I mean, it's, it's a amazing place, but mm -hmm. it was, it, you know, it was kind of new agey, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and I'm, sure. and I'm used to new agey people being, and not receptive to an idea like that. So I thought that was, I thought it was yeah. cool. It's, I, it spoke to me, it spoke volumes about um, PRS and the people that run it. Yeah. And, you know, all these different organizations go through phases based upon who's running things. And so, um, you know, as long as somebody is running things who fosters an atmosphere of openness, uh, it's wonderful, you know, and at the same time, if there's something that they'd rather not have me talk about, they can come up to me. I, I'm totally approachable in this mm -hmm. regard and say, look, Mitch, could you, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I'll be like, look, you know, I'm a guest here. Uh, as you said, my search is a many spoked wheel. I don't feel silenced or offended or bothered right. if, you know, uh, I'm speaking at a funeral and it might be a good time for me not to talk about Satanism, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of things I'm happy to talk to people about. And I don't want to put barriers up, you know, right. Um, several weeks ago, a Christian press sent me a biography of the televangelist Oral Roberts. And they asked me for a quote of endorsement. And I was like, well, this is a surprise. <laughs> and uh, I read it and I liked it and I provided an endorsement. And the reason they reached out to me is because um, I write about oral in my book, One Simple Idea. I wrote about oral in a piece on Politico, and I have a lot of respect for Oral Roberts, and I'm not opposed to any of the mainstream faiths. And in fact, I'm really interested in the more mystically inclined uh, variants of Christianity, mm -hmm. which sometimes are very socially conservative, like Pentecostalism, right. ch charismatic Christianity. I I I love the, the the mystical expressions that run through Catholicism. I am not in any way shut down or on the other side of right. any expression and or search and and so i was very happy to provide the quote um i'll have to look it up to see you know if they used it but but i was <laughs> glad that they felt moved to reach out to me and i i i i praised the book on its own terms it was a very very good biography of a very searching figure but also a very 
uh, a commercially driven figure as well. And mm-hmm. uh, this is a little bit off, off off to the margins, but one of the things that I've always been struck by, and this is really something that uh, many journalists and many academics do a very poor job with, you will never understand um, uh, uh, American religion, particularly in its more uh, public or fervent expressions, if you see it only through one lens, very often like in figures like Oral Roberts. And I would say the same thing is true of Joel Osteen. There's a mixture of sincerity and guile, sincerity and guile. There's the direct marketing, there's the money mm-hmm. solicitation. And and yet you also find, at least certainly was the case with Oral, and I, I mean, he left behind letters and records that make this plain, uh, there was also a search. You know, there was also a search. And there was a friction in this man's life between the side of him that was an authentically searching uh, man of the Bible and and a guy who ran a business and was right. very adept at running a business. And so it's never just one thing or the other. You know, that kind of gets back to what we were talking yeah. about earlier of like, you know, oh, you're just in this for the money. And it's like, believe me, you know, yeah, I'm sure you could find some people who are just in something or other for the money, but there's usually a, a complexity of factors behind what people are about, right. even if, you know, in some cases, money may be the primary thing. But in matters of belief, I have found that people usually have traveled very unusual roads to get where they are. And, you know, some of them give in to corruption and chicanery and cynicism. Some of them, like Oral, sort of struggle among, you know, a lot of different impetuses that they experience. But people are very rarely monochromatic, right? And so, anyway, I was I was glad to be sent that book. I was glad to read it. I was glad to endorse it. Uh, I was, you know, that is a a distinct conversation by itself. I don't need to bring everything that I've ever thought about into every conversation I've ever had, you know, and, <laughs> um, but I do need to be free to weave in and out of institutions so I can pursue my search. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I, I, th- I was sitting next to a woman who uh, I think worked or volunteered maybe at PRS and uh, I forget, Oh, what's her name that you introduced me to? That was a uh, grace who gave me the broom. Was that, is that right? Uh, I don't. Or maybe it was Kelly. Yeah, Ke- um, there's Kelly, and there was a, another woman that was sitting next to me. My point was uh, that I wanted to say, m- bring up, was that I, you know, I thought it was they didn't look like people how I at, at, in that environment that I would traditionally think would be accepting of someone who's talked want to talk about Satanism or brought mm-hmm. Satanism up. And mm-hmm. um, it's the same way when I see people at uh, uh, my art shows that that are fans but they just look normal <laughs> it's like yes. there's this kind of like I, I i you know i'm not i i love i love people that that, that go all out and dress the part you know i think it's cool it's it, it, that show up at my shows and stuff that are into it i love that i wish i kind of wish i could be that way i just don't feel natural being that way i mm-hmm. i, I mm-hmm. the way i am is the way i feel feel natural and mm-hmm. um uh but 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 you know, you, you it's it always feels like um, uh, when when you see people that to me that says when they, when they have the appearance of just like you know not super gothy or or whatever, but they're into into the artwork or they're into what you're saying. It's 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 almost like a win. It's like that person's really cool <laughs> because because they're not it's they're not playing. A, 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 I don't, I don't want to word this wrong and insult people that, that are all goth. Cause I think that's, you know, I'm totally into that Absolutely. too, but it's yeah. like, I appreciate people that don't dress like that, that are into this stuff that, that you yeah, can't judge it, the book the, as easily by the yeah, cover. It's delightful. I mean, like we were talking about Whitley street, but Whitley is like a roadmap yeah. of the American <laughs> avant-garde. Right. And yet, you know, you meet him and he's, you know, just wearing a pair of slacks and a button yeah. shirt. And he's like, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and um, like, you know, uh, 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 and yet, you know, you get to talking to him about his life, his background, where he's been, where what he's done, and it's mind blowing. But there's not a, 
you know, requisite uniform there. Right. And sometimes the uniform is good because mm -hmm. it, it signals to other people, yeah. hey, this is what I'm into. And if you're into this, you and I might have something to do together. Plus, it makes the individual feel good, which right, I really, right. really validate. Yeah. But it 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 ought not be a necessity. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's how uh, Bekshinsky was. I don't know if you. I think I mentioned Bekshinsky last time, but he's ama amazing, amazing, dark. He's there's Giger and then there's Bekshinsky. These are oh the, yes. Uh, but yeah, he was like this old Polish guy, you know, just like <laughs> super normal looking old Polish guy with glasses, looked like someone's grandpa. Uh, but he he was his artwork was just so like intense and amazing uh, that you know. There's something to be said about, I don't know, not, not, I don't, it's, it's, you know, it's on the inside. What counts yeah, is on and the you inside. Know, <laughs> I mean, William Burroughs used to model this well, you know, I mean, he was just always dressed in a gray suit and his right, tie right, and, yeah, yeah. you know, and he's a complete lunatic, but <laughs> you know, maybe in a certain sense, that was almost like an anti-cool uniform, yeah, whatever right. it was, it, it served to indicate, you know, you don't have to be, you don't, there's no requisite way of showing up you know alan ginsburg was the same way you know i mean later in his life you know alan would walk into a room and he'd be wearing a cardigan or he'd be wearing a suit and he'd be very approachable hey how you doing what's mm -hmm. up could talk to anybody and he's a madman but he didn't he didn't make people feel uncomfortable yeah. he allowed he allowed people to approach him and that was you know if i may put it in these terms that was his uniform in a certain sense right like, you think i'm going to be this 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 fucking lunatic but the truth is you want to say hi to me just come up and say hi to me and how you doing and, right and that's that you yeah. know and, and it's 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 really can be very wonderful yeah yeah i appreciate that um i appreciate that and and uh mike watt which i mentioned last time my, one of my punk rock heroes from the Minutemen, is like mm -hmm. that you know yes you know the you know the, un, the the uh flannel that's his uniform form a flannel shirt rolled up sleeves rolled up pair of jeans pair of converse and it's like it's yeah oh, he always wears that and he's super cool it's very like we'll just talk to anybody and i just appreciate that yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, this shit that I'm wearing, this is it, you know, right. ancient alien says, could you throw in a blazer? And I'm like, boys, I don't own a blazer, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, uh, this is it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that, I, that, that was, you know, I, I've heard in, uh, in, in your uh, speeches and, and, and in your books and stuff, just you talking about that uh, transformation or, or, you know what you were what a, a new age writer was supposed to look like and and now exactly. you just started wearing your own shirts your own clothes and um oh i was so much happier yeah and so much more relaxed and, and it's so it's such a it's not the adopting of a costume it's right the dropping of a costume right exactly so, yeah you're wearing the costume before and now you're right. not wearing the costume exactly because the dude who goes on such and such documentary he should be wearing a blazer and right. you know have books in his background or whatever. And, and, and that's fine. If, if that's how yeah, the individual that's comports him or herself in life, I do. Um, I'm not allowed to talk about details of this, but I did <laughs> shoot a part in a movie where I play a newscaster and uh, it's, um, it's playing a role and I do wear a borrowed uh, 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 shirt and tie. The shirt didn't fit me. We had to put, um, safety pins on the on the collar and then <laughs> button up the tie real tight and um and 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 it's playing a role and i i'm playing a character and i honor uh the needs of the drama and the needs of the character um but it it may be the one and only time people see me on screen uh, in a, in a suit. <laughs> I think that you know that I think it's funny because that was a that was a shrewd not that you meant it that way but but you, you could say oh that was a shrewd move by you to be the punk rock new age satanic dude you know what I mean it's like it's a, it's an example of following your heart doing what yeah. you love being yourself and it works in a way and, and that is not predictable, I guess. You I, know what I, I mean? Well, I appreciate that. You know, it just, it came totally naturally. Like I remember when I got my first like large tattoo, mm -hmm. it's upside down here on the screen, but this is Buddy Holly with his feet up 
here oh, cool. instead of down here. <laughs> but I, I don't know why, but I just said to myself, I wanted a tattoo of Buddy Holly, Sasquatch, Flying Saucers, <laughs> and the Great Pyramid. And I asked a couple of people, could you do up a a, a mural for me like that and I'll bring it to the tattoo artist and somebody uh wonderful uh designer did up this this mural I brought it to the tattoo artist he replicated it completely and I was very happy you know I was very very happy mm. and then like you know you'd be amazed I mean talk about the the manner in which a uniform can help you reach people you know I'll be going through the TSA line or I'll be crossing a border and one of the uniform dudes would be like, holy shit, buddy Holly. And like, right. suddenly we're pals. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's just an expression of enthusiasm. Right, yeah. More. yeah. Yeah, that was one of the good things, I think, or uh, one of the things I thought was was uh, smart about Anton Le- LaVey's, uh, uh, I forget how he put it, but it was like the idea that dressing a certain way is important or, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I'd Anton never really... Speak of- Thought, oh, I, I no, I just I hadn't thought about it before until I'd read that. It's like that makes sense, you know. That makes sense yeah. to me. Anton would talk about creating a total environment. Yeah, the importance of creating a total right. environment. And Walt Disney was a master of that. And and you see how you know you you just want every detail to be just so. Right. And it's a it's a tonic to the spirit in mm-hmm. a certain way. And Anton, it seems to me, was very aware of what he could express, what he could get across, what what he could kind of pull off in, in terms of his theatricality. And I say that in the warmest and most affectionate way, because um, I was re-watching um, Invocation of My Demon Brother the other night, because of course I'm trying to look, trying to find Whitley and I'm like, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find him, I'm gonna find him. And, and um, I did not succeed in that, but there's <laughs> Anton in the movie wearing a cape and his devil's horns and, if a, if someone tried to do that and the enthusiasm wasn't there and the overall package right. wasn't there, it'd be like, who the fuck is this guy wearing <laughs> a Halloween costume? You know, but he does it and it's alluring, it's threatening, it's, mm-hmm. it's there's a beauty to it, mm-hmm. and um and he 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 understood that, you know, he really understood that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, yeah, I uh, I have to ask this before I know we're getting close to the end, and, and you've got a whole other interview um, going on. Take a nap. Yeah, you have, you have a whole other. Coast you have a tonight. nap. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm in a nap. Yeah. <laughs> I just had a couple things before before I let, oh take let your you time, go. man. Okay. I always enjoy our exchanges so much. I take appreciate it. Uh, yeah. um, okay, so one great uh, thing I learned from your writings is this idea that we are selecting reality rather than manifesting reality that's like Mm -hmm. huge for me i just think it's Mm -hmm. like it just as soon as you said it and explained why it was like oh obviously (laughs) that makes so much more sense than than manifesting i remember one time on a little tangent i did have one time i um when i was younger i tripped on mushrooms and i was i i had this kind of vision of this stuff that the universe was made of and it the idea was that in my vision um if you focused your energy it's like i already knew this my mom taught me this stuff so you know i could have been just regurgitating it and and you know uh in a trip vision but i saw this stuff it was like pink kind of like Mm -hmm. stuff primordial stuff like little dots or something it's hard to explain pinks and purples and the idea was like this is the stuff this is the stuff that everything's made of Mm -hmm. and if you and it if you focus your energy on it you can the stuff will manifest from your reality will manifest from this stuff you know i'm sure it was some just a metaphor for what i already believed you know what i mean but Mm -hmm. um uh the idea that uh uh we are selecting reality is uh it just it just intuitively made made sense to me but um so my question is now if we're selecting our realities out of all the multitude of realities can't we individually select a reality with less assholes in it and uh, select a reality with where the environment is being dealt with 
and select a reality that isn't so kind of fucked up. I mean, yeah. in, in theory, sure. Do you know what I'm saying? Because that re- that reality exists. It re- exists in oh, oh. pure potentiality. So it seems Without like question. you could manifest yourself there, and everything would be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, I think I think a lot depends, first of all, upon the individual's authentic wishes. You know, right. like, for example, some of us say, like, I want less assholes, but we secretly enjoy fighting. And, right. you know, I don't mean that in a glib way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know the onrush of thrill that one gets when you're engaged in a in a Twitter fight, you know, but I realized at a certain point, this is not constructive this is not yeah. positive this is this is a a test of who has more free time it's on his so, hands. it's like and, a, it's a know. it's recently on there i've been you know i'm sorry to interrupt but it's just like it's so bad it's, it's so bad it's like it's you just insipid. see these comments back and forth back and forth it's going nowhere it's nowhere. going it nowhere. Doesn't change anybody's mind doesn't, about anything. It doesn't change anything. It just it, it doesn't tell to vote in one direction or the other. It just ever. It's just two <laughs> people pissing each other off, and it, on yeah. and on. It's like it's so. Uh, I don't know. I can't even find the word to describe it. It's just like yeah. hopeless. This bottomless pit of despair or something. It's, it's so, so bad. It's so awful, and it takes so many years to learn your way out of it. I mean, I. Yeah. I'm I'm turning 57 this month and you know Scorpio. I Oh, a Sag actually. I'm on the cusp. I'm oh, okay, the Scorpio okay. Cusp, but <laughs> just just squeaked in Sag. <laughs> Sorry. Um no, not at all. And uh you know, it took me a really long time because it's very emotional. Yeah. And we want to make our point of view known. We want to be seen. We want to be understood. And and the language that we're conditioned to doing that in is is sarcasm, mm-hmm. rhetorical questions, insults, um, eye rolls, and so forth. And it takes a really long time, you know, and it I guess it depends what the individual wants you know what the individual right. wants i mean you know I, I have a chapter in daydream believer entitled are we gods in our own realities where i really try to get into tracing out a potential metaphysics for this idea that um you know where we're kind of selecting a world because obviously you're here i'm here your listeners are here um there are people in the next room who might need something from you in 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 five minutes or whatever it may be. We're here, you know. We're here, mm-hmm. and 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 so, in what manner can it be said that the individual is is selecting experience? And I I went into such a kind of space when I was writing that chapter that I was I was almost getting to the point where it's kind of like you have a dream, you wake up. And you remember the dream vividly, and then it recedes over the course of the day, and you've only remembered bits and pieces mm-hmm. of it. But there were moments where I was writing that chapter where I was like, I feel self-persuaded by this. I feel there's consistency here. So I won't attempt to repeat what I traced out in that chapter, and I don't know that I could, but it is there. And I wrote it with great sincerity, and I think it is um, expressed in plain language. And so if the individual wants a better world, then that person would have to really want that better world down to, I think, details and passion, Mm. because it seems to me that the thing that triggers the wish machine, so to speak, is that passion, that emotional passion, that mental focus. And I've had lots of people who come up to me, you know, in spiritual centers and tell me they're all about service and they've got a shiv mm. like right behind their back, ready to give it to you between the ribs, <laughs> you know, the minute you use the wrong word or do something wrong or whatever. So, you know, that, 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 you know, what we say we want and what we really want or what the wish machine uh, kind of crucifies that's on, you know, right. like, because if we say we want something, but we want something else, it's, it's the emotively charged thing that, that that rules the equation we're creatures of emotion um we're not creatures of of pr exactly and the pr that we tell ourselves doesn't do very much good you know it's just like spraying perfume on yourself but right. you know it it's a very very surface temporary kind of anesthetizing of of what's really happening and so i would say does the individual uh sincerely 
want that mm -hmm. and 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 is he or she focused on it like i mean if you said to me mitch are you concerned about global warming i'd say well fuck yeah i'm concerned but I don't really act that way every day. Right. You know? yeah. And I, you know, I buy these disposable vape sticks and throw them the mm -hmm. fuck out. And I'm like, that's a lot of fucking plastic I'm throwing out, you know? <laughs> so, but I do it. And, and right. so I have to question, you know, whether I'm really. Putting but, skin uh, in the game. Yeah. 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 But there's, there's also the, you know, the sense that, you know, how are you, how could that make a much of a difference? Right. But that's the, that the that's, that's a good question. That's the whole right. problem right. of everything. It's like how you know. It's like you know. We're we're on one hand we're we're. It's like we're all along for the ride of this thing that's happening. On one yeah. hand, and then the other hand, you've got this power to create your own reality uh, to a certain degree for sure. I you know it's like I've done it. I've done it for sure. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I feel, you know, it's it's a weird mix of being on this out of control train that this, this world is, but also having uh, power within your own life to kind of make things the way you want them. It's it's strange. It's strange. It's almost like on this huge level. No, it feels like on this giant level, you can't really do anything about the big thing, but you can do something about the little thing, which is your life. You can't do anything yeah. about the macro, but you can do something about the micro. And you can test that thesis. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, you could really test it. And um But the macro just... should affect the micro. So if individual people are doing it, it should reflect in the greater world, right? I would think so. You know, I would think so. Um and I guess it it has to start to some extent, at least as far as like ethical or spiritual philosophy, it seems to me that the only empiricism we have is experience. So it has to start, it seems to me, with experience. Mm -hmm. And so I always challenge people, like, desist from trash talk on social media right. for one hour and right. see if see what happens. Just 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 that. See what happens. Most people couldn't care less. And desisting from it on one hour would be a joke because they don't feel like they're engaging in trash talk. All right. Even though they're, you know, they feel like, well, I'm just doing what's right, you know, which is what's, <laughs> yeah. which I'm sure, you know, Vladimir Putin feels, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like, well, you know, yeah. we got fucked when this Cold War ended and we're going to upright that apple cart. Right. And I don't care what it costs, you know. Everybody who's ever thrown a rock thinks they're justified. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever thrown a rock not feeling justified. So the individual has to decide, you know, what what he or she really wants. And then you look, I suppose, for experience and see if there's some correlation there. I, it seems like, if you know, the idea that, you know, you're talking about these scientific studies where one thing affects another thing, you know, at great distances. Yeah. And everything has an effect on everything else. It, seems to me like if there was any way to uh actually make the world a better place it would be by starting and it sounds selfish and kind of goes against what people tell you it's like to get your own life to to affect your own life it seems like that would resonate and the only way that you could actually do anything is if you you know i guess in order you you could do what you're doing which is help other people learn how to um create the life that they want and that's, that's all you can wish, you that's know. kind of all you can do really and then mm -hmm. the the rest it seems like would ripple outward uh, in theory <laughs> but well you know it, it it it's what you're saying does square well with chaos theory as well as with chaos magic mm -hmm. if we live in an interconnected system which seems indisputable then it does stand to reason that tightening one screw, you know, does change everything. It might seem infinitesimal at first, but in a system that's very complex and dynamic, one change obviously can have, even you'd say must have, a great ripple. So chaos theory and chaos magic, I think, uh, are very valuable um, in terms of understanding that, in terms of sometimes affecting that. Yeah, I, I I wanted to uh, talk quickly too about this idea. You know, you you bring up service a lot. How people talk about service and how service is important, and mm -hmm. and I just wanted to give you my um my experience with that, uh, and, and just to see what you think. Because my experience was I had this big spiritual experience in eighty seven, and I spent the next ten years doing what I thought I should do to be of service, 
mm-hmm. to save the world. You know, it was very much like what people, when, especially people that, that that have psychedelic experiences when they're young, and and you know, everyone thinks they're it's their job to save the world after that because they've been enlightened. Typical, yeah. you know, it's common. <laughs> it's not uncommon at all. So you know, I spent so much time thinking like I have to, and it's so ego centered or whatever you want. It's so kind of self aggrandizing. Anyway, that's not the point. Uh, so I, I did that. I went through, uh, and 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 it's like every way I tried to do it just failed. Yeah, it failed, and it was so. And you know, I was trying to do it through music through my band, and then mm-hmm. the band finally broke up, and I was like, "All right, fuck this." I just, I'm. This is ten years I've been trying this. It's, um, and it was like really uh, uh, such a bummer, very depressing, and I got to that point where where I um, uh, was like, "I'm just gonna do what I love." I'm going to paint. I'm going to paint monsters. That seems like the most fun thing in the world. I, that's That seems to be my purpose for whatever reason. It makes no sense. So anyway, uh, I I followed that path, which was just like doing what I love. And I at, at this point now, I am of service to a lot of people, like in the dark art community. I, I've, I've, but it was a natural thing. So it's, 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 I, I think I've, you know, I've uh, tried to, galvanize the community the dark art community we're kind of small relatively speaking to the to the 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 regular art world and the rest of the world and so i using this podcast to try and galvanize people give people a place it just seemed like a natural thing to do for me you know as part of my life as an artist and um and i do mentorships on my patreon it's like and so i it's like i became of service naturally naturally by by not by saying fuck all that, you have to be of service. I'm just gonna follow my path and do what I really feel strongly, what I feel is in my heart. Follow your heart, you know. Um, and so it, it, it's like I, I'm, I am of, I am doing stuff of service, but it's not because I set out to do that. It's just it, it, it was a natural unfolding of the process yeah. of becoming myself and 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 doing my uh, true will, I guess you would say. And I think that's perfectly put doing your true will, doing your true yeah. will. And that's beautiful. You know, when I see people make declarations of service on social media or at spiritual centers, very often it's just an act of perfumery. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Talmud says, beware the man who bespeaks his own virtue. <laughs> and you probably find iterations of that in every wisdom tradition right. on earth, <laughs> you know, and and that's because it's true. And um, <laughs> and, and I, I, I've always found that the people who, who stick the shiv in my ribs are always the most outwardly virtuous. Right. And very Howard made a statement, and this is a really tough statement because it's the kind of thing people immediately want to argue with. But Vernon would say a lot of things like this, and it just bears living with. He would always say, show me the victim and I'll show you the bully. And it's like, you know, how dare you? That's victim blaming. And, you know, just 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 live with it. Just give it six months. Just give it six months. You don't have to get a tattoo of it. You know, you just (laughs) give it six months and see what you think of that. Show me the victim. And I'll show you the bully. And, you know, life is very strange. And yet, you know, the 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 adoption of these um, um, identifiers are usually intended to bring something helpful, uh, self-perceived as helpful to the individual in ways that they can't even admit. There was an FBI agent who told a friend of mine who had gotten ripped off in some con scheme. He said, you know. Here's something to watch out for. Uh, sociopaths very often are good at eliciting sympathy. And if you meet somebody and you've never encountered that person before, and you suddenly find yourself feeling sympathy for that person, be careful. Be mm. careful. That can be a warning flag because sociopaths are incredibly good at eliciting sympathy from people. And I think that the naturalness of expression is is infinitely more real than any declaration of anything, um, which is why I get very suspicious by PNs to service on the spiritual path. And that's partly just experiential because I, 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 I've been around for a little while now and I, I have seen a lot of people using that term. <laughs> and that movie usually has a really bad ending. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I, I, it's funny, I remember... Um, there was a story told about Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. And I think uh, I think it was told by his widow, Blanche Barton, who's a very good writer. 
I don't remember specifically. I might have that wrong, but but I think Blanche told this story that Anton was on the street one day in San Francisco and some kid came up to him and he said, you know, oh my God, you know, Anton LaVey, you know, I've 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 always wanted to, you know, talk to you. I had questions I wanted to ask you. And and Anton said, I don't do business on the street. And he just walked away from the kid. And then he stopped and he was like, ah, you know, the kid seems sincere. And he walked back and he said, All right, look, you know, what what's on your mind? And it wasn't because Anton was kind. Anton was not kind. <laughs> he, but he sensed an actualness, you know, to the person. He sensed a genuineness to the person. And he was nobody's fool. And he dealt with a bunch of assholes and he didn't feel like dealing with assholes. Right. But, you know, he circled back to the kid, not because he was, you know, having a Santa Claus moment, but because he sensed that there was something sincere, something of substance in the person's question. Sincerity is so rare when it's real. Mm -hmm. And I guess he sensed it. So he went back. He wasn't being of service. You know, he was just naturally expressing well, I suppose. Yeah, interesting. So it's, it's I guess, maybe having more of a fine-tuned intuition as opposed to going by rote. And also, in, in, you know, yeah grokking to people who are on your team, grokking right. to people who are in your community. I think there's a certain degree of solidarity there. I wrote a piece at Medium called Satan's Honor Roll, where I laid out what I thought were the ethics of Satanism. And I don't think it's one of the most mature pieces that I ever wrote, but I'll never <laughs> disavow it because it's totally sincere. And I talked about um, loyalty, solidarity, mm. keeping your word, telling the truth. And these are hard fucking values, in application, right. in application, and they require a lot of self-sufficiency. So I do think there's a naturalness that that the individual is entitled to express, and that naturalness may be generative to somebody else. Uh, it may not be generative to everybody, but somebody who's in your um, uh, um, circle of sympathies uh, may be very touched. It may be very helped at a certain moment by that. And that's all to the good. Right. Well, don't, I, solidarity. yeah, don't, don't you, I mean, I feel like, you know, your, your path has also been as resulted in service to others throughout the expression of your true will. Don't you kind of feel that? Cause it's like, you know, you're writing these books that are helping people, but you're doing it cause you're interested in it and you love to write and you love to speak and you love to present these ideas to people. It's you're not necessarily doing it so that you can save the world. You're doing it because you love to do it. And as a result, you are being of service inadvertently. You know what I mean? Well, I, I figure that no life is exceptional. And if an individual has had an experience, it's very rare that that experience is exclusive to him or her alone. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, if I'm giving a talk on a practical theme and this occurred at the workshop at PRS, I almost always touch on the point of getting away from cruel people because I think right. it's the last thing that we're conditioned to think of. And we're told about forgiveness and we're told about, you know, right. light a candle, say a prayer, burn incense, hold the person in light, <laughs> uh, meditate. And and uh, or, you know, all all, you know, uh, solutions have to come from within. Try this cognitive exercise. It's in your reactions. But the person who's prescribing that very rarely, if ever, is an example of actual first person success with that. Because mm -hmm. if you walk out of the therapist's office and his mother calls and pushes his buttons, he's going to be like, Mom, uh, and he's a 15 year old <laughs> child again, you right. know, and 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 we rarely think of the imperative of getting away from cruel people. And it's amazing how, on one hand, how basic it is, but how, on the other hand, um, our spiritual and therapeutic cultures throw up so much to disrupt that, whereas it may be the only solution. Mm -hmm. And and I want people to be free to avail themselves of that solution and not feel that by habit, by bloodline, by whatever tendrils of connection they feel bound, they have to do something in a certain way. That to me is ridiculous. And it's a formula for great unhappiness. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult to do too. when it's blood. It is difficult. It's... And <laughs> I often tell people sometimes the consequences are too great for us right, to do it because right. there right. are consequences and there are debts 
and the consequences might be too great. But something I also spoke at at the workshop, at least know that that's what you want to do. Hold that in yourself and vow that at the first physical or geographical or economic opportunity, whatever it is, I'm going to get away from this person. And don't tell anyone what you're doing. You're not arguing. You're resolving. Yeah. And, you know, at least know it. To not know it would be a great tragedy, it seems to me. Yeah. And s sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes you are forced into the per the person for as coming from experience. It's like sometimes the person forces you to make that choice. To, yeah. And you, oh, without you know, question. And it's, and it's without question. And it can be the greatest gift because yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, sometimes, and, and that the, the tipping point can be small, you know, it mm -hmm. can be just like, I've been insulted by this person every right. fucking day for 25 <laughs> years. And, you know, on Tuesday, he or she said to me, uh, oh, you know, I like such and such milk in my coffee. You don't have that. And you're just like, I'm done. <laughs> and it ain't because of the fucking milk. You know? yeah. <laughs> but 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 you, you can have these moments of clarity sometimes arise from very small things. But these small things are core samples of the whole problem. Yeah. Well, OK, so getting back just real quick and I'll let you go. So getting back to uh, uh, the, the service idea, don't you kind of feel like you're 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 being of service to people? Well, and uh, I. <laughs> not not made necessarily intentionally, but I mean, I would say that your readers. <laughs> no, no, just just in the, in the in regards to you know you bringing up kind of the hypocrisy of how people yeah, talk about service and it being an obligation and things like that. Uh, I would say that all of your readers, myself included, feel like you're being in service of us with by uh, sharing your ideas. So, you know, you 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 are intentionally or not. I mean, you don't agree? <laughs> well, I, I have an allergy maybe to the term service. Uh, <laughs> I'm but, not a big service guy. I'm not yeah. a guy who uses that term. I'm only bringing it up because you but bring I it up But I do believe so in defending uh, people I love. I do want to show loyalty and solidarity. I do want sensitive people to feel less alone. Um, if somebody is sensitive and if I feel a sense of kinship with that person defined however broadly um uh i i i find it a positive expression of self that that person feel less alone so if there's an idea that strikes somebody that facilitates a better life for that person i am gratified by that um and i don't want to get excessively hung up on terms you know i don't want to be orthodox to the point where it's like don't say service around yeah. me you know so but, same with say how people uh, <laughs> people view the word satanism the same thing. exactly <laughs> and i might exactly and so i don't want to replicate that you know but i i might think in terms of solidarity uh loyalty mm -hmm. um a kind of uh choice of comrades uh wanting to speak to somebody who is is in a a, a difficulty and and maybe I feel a kinship with that person. I think that I enter into that a lot in the best experiences I have with my readers. You know, I mean, not mm -hmm. everybody likes my books. You know, there'll be the errant person who's like, you know, he's a motherfucker. And, you know, <laughs> and, the, you know, he's being so negative and it's like, well, they're not getting it yeah, because right. you can't have genuine ideals unless you see life in all of its consequences, including its catastrophes. But 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 that only deepens the wrestling match, you know, with all this material. And if I can reach a reader and I get so many beautiful, beautiful emails from people and I feel a sense of authentic kinship with that with that person. So if I'm if I'm being of a help, uh, then I, I I'm moved by that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply gladdened by that very much. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a byproduct of. Enacting expression, your true, yeah, of ex expressing your yeah. true will in in life. I mean, and I, I I I do think, I mean, it might might be idealistic of me, but I think when you do discover and express your true will and live your true will, you, that's kind of like the best gift you can give to the world. I think that naturally you end up, you, you will end up enriching other people's lives and helping other people's in other people in ways you never really imagined, and it's a real true. It's a real help. It's a pure help. It's real. It's not a, I'm doing this because I think I'm supposed to for whatever reason. You know what I mean? It's almost like yeah, the, the reason for the help 
makes a difference. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Gurdjieff, I think, would use the term help. And I like that. I like that term. I okay. just like it. But uh, again, we'll I don't want help, to create a service. liturgy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay to say service. Kidding. I mean, I don't want to create a liturgy, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but okay. I, I, I resound to, you know, that resonates with me. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to let you take your nap. I really thank you. I totally appreciate you coming on again. I, Pleasure, I, man. I could keep, Pleasure. I could keep going. I could go for, you know, a long time. We'll do it again. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. We'll yeah. do it again. You're, you're, I always dig it. Yeah. Yeah. You're the, uh, you've got an open spot on here. Let me just show this for people who are wa- going to watch on YouTube. This is the book you need to buy on certain <laughs> places. This is it. It's available now by the time this, uh, airs. So, yeah. Um, right. Right. Um, yeah, and, and good luck on Coast to Coast tonight. It, this Thank will, you, This will man. be airing tomorrow, but um, yeah. Good, I'll, I, I'll look forward to it. I'll be getting up, <laughs> you know, like slogging through my kitchen, like, oh, wait, Chet Show is on. So cool. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so we just got to say goodbye to the audience and don't hang up. So let's just say goodbye, audience, and, and however you like. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>